Hello and welcome back to GISC 125, Mapping and Spatial Thinking. And today we're going to discuss a little bit about spatial analysis issues. So whenever we look at a map, we inherently start turning the map into information by finding patterns, assessing trends, or making decisions. So this is spatial analysis, and it's what our minds do naturally whenever we look at a map. We did spatial analysis when we were looking at the presidential election map. We mapped where things are, how people voted, how they relate to other variables like income and race, and what these variables mean in terms of voting patterns. Action to, uh, to take could be presidential nominees to get out the vote in areas where there is a close tie between Republicans and Democrats. So Tobler's first law of geography in spatial analysis. So Tobler's first law of geography states that everything is related to everything else, but nearer things are more related than distant things. So what does that mean? Everything is related to everything else, but nearer things are more related than distant things. So obviously when studying the spatial realities of the earth, distance is important. For example, Places will be less impacted by a given phenomena, for example, an earthquake or a flood, if they are further away than if they are nearby. So another example is that when you are, you are probably more similar to your neighbor in terms of your income and race than, say, people in Oregon. But let's take a look at some additional examples. So. As we said, Tobler's first law of geography that nearer things are more related than distant things is employed in spatial modeling. And so here we can use uh, birth, teen birth rates. And we can see that states in the south tend to be more similar than states as you go north. So there's some kind of spatial correlation here. Here's another example of temperature. So Nearer temperatures are more similar than distant temperatures. So we can look here in kind of the southern states and into Mexico is kind of warmer. And then as we're going north, it's getting cooler and cooler. And those temperatures are more similar to each other. So if Tobler's first law of geography weren't true, GS would be impossible because we could not detect any spatial analysis and life would be impossible. It would kind of look like this diagram. It would just be completely random. For example, um, if you're walking down the street, it's nice and level, then all of a sudden you get to a mountain and it's Mount Everest. And then you go down and then it's down into the Grand Canyon. And then you're walking a few more feet and it's uh, flat. And then it's another canyon. It would be totally unpredictable. So, total first law, near things are more similar. So if it's probably a flat ground, it's going to be probably more similar flat. Another example is um, temperature. So the temperature, let's say, is 80 degrees in Boise. Meridian, which is close, is probably going to be close to 80 degrees. It's not going to be 110. It's not going to be minus 20. It's going to be somewhere close in the 80s, whether it's 80 or 81 or 82. But if you go to the coast, for example, Oregon, a little more distant, it's probably going to be a little bit more cooler since it's next to the ocean. So as Tobler's Law first said, um, nearer things are more similar than distant things. So to further expand on Tobler's first law is that when two geographic entities are related, there is a positive or negative correlation between these entities. So let's look at this example here. So you can see in the map above that there are counties that show up that are dark blue green. And this is a bivariate, two variable coracleth map where the x-axis is kind of showing us with green colors is used to show precipitation values. And in the x-axis, the blue categories color show lung cancer mortality rates. So when you see the dark blue green colors at the high end of both the x and the y-axis, we're looking at counties that are high in both these variables. So places that are only green or only blue are lower on other respective variables. And so the scatter plot at the bottom right corner shows the data distribution of both these variables. You probably can't read the correlation measure, but it says that the R square is about 
0.48. And that's a strong correlation measurement compared to most other known relationships between lung cancer and, and excuse me, mortality and other variables. You know, poverty and smoking show strong associations too, for example. So when counties are both high in precipitation and high in lung cancer mortality are selected, you get this map. So most of the counties are located in the southeast United States. So there's nothing to report. It's just a correlation, nothing causal. It's not that rain has any real important impact on lung cancer mortality. It just happens to rain more where people are who meet a range of other risk factors. So this is a perfect example to demonstrate how correlation is not the same as causation. So I'll repeat this, correlation is not causation. So there's many, many examples of, of this. So another example you can make up that, let's say 80% of all traffic accidents this morning, the driver had drank coffee that morning. Well, is coffee the cause of the car accident? No, it might be um, due to the sun in their eyes. It might be due to them texting, something like that. There's a correlation, but there's no causation between car accidents and drinking coffee in the morning. So the next thing to look at is something called the modifiable aerial unit problem. And when analyzing spatial data in GIS, it's common to aggregate data by area. So the essence of this MOP is that different aggregation schemes produce different results. And this happens because data is not uniform over space. So modifiable area unit problem takes two forms, the scale effect and the zonal effect. So the scale effect is different statistical results can be obtained from the same data set when the information is grouped at different levels of spatial resolution. So example, if you're aggregating areas at the census tract level, at the state level, at the county level, you're going to get different results. We can see this in the middle diagram where the spatial resolution, so the size of the area, was changed. So the percent of university degrees is much different due to the size of the area. Scale effect is important due to averaging. This means that extreme values are often less common if the aggregation regions are bigger because extreme values are average with lower values. So this effect can smooth out important data points, giving a false impression of homogeneity. Another example of this is with uh, gerrymandering. So the zonal effect is observed when the scale of analysis is fixed, but the shape of the aggregation unit is changed. And we can see this at the bottom diagram where the scale is fixed, but all we're doing is changing the shape it has changed. And it also changes the, the, the um, results. So the modifiable aerial unit problem is a big uh, topic. There'll be some other reading on it, but just have a general understanding of what is going on and be aware of it. So normalizing is the process of dividing one numeric attribute value by another to minimize differences in value based on the size of an area or the number of features in each area. For example, normalizing, dividing the total population by the total area yields population unit area or a density map. Remember, all choropleth maps need to be normalized. So let's say we're trying to analyze social media campaign that the restaurant Chick-fil-A is running. So here we collected tweets from the data and produced the following Twitter map. So we're not able to derive much insight from this map. There are just too many points on the map on top of each other. So let's try aggregating this uh, to counties to produce a choropleth map of the number of tweets in each county. So now we have a better view of which counties are tweeting more about Chick-fil-A than others. Remember we're mapping <clears throat> excuse me, the number of tweets. But it's not very particular useful metric since we're mapping the number of tweets. So let's take a look here. Los Angeles County, which is shown by the blue area, has a population of around 10 million compared to San Bernardino, California, shown in with the red area, has about 2 million uh, people. 
We wouldn't be surprised if we see more tweets in Los Angeles because there's just more people there to tweet, right? More people to possible to tweet, more possible tweets. So what we really want is the number of tweets per person in each county and not, oops, sorry, <laughs> and not the number of people per tweets. So here we can apply a normalization gives us a much better view of where our social media campaign is having an effect. What really becomes apparent is in eastern Texas, which has a significant number of tweets per person by county. So if we didn't normalize our data, we'd make it a Coropuff map that would simply be showing mapping the population of where people are. So as you can see in this map, San Bernardino and um, Los Angeles County don't have that many people tweeting about um, as a percentage. So we can see Southeast Texas has a much higher. So this is why you always want to normalize your data. And in this case, what we did is we took the number of people who tweeted and we divided it by the total population of that county. So we normalize our data. We came up with a percentage. So normalize your data if you're making a Coropleth map.